All right, good morning. Before we get started this morning on Resurrection Sunday, I'd like to make some announcements and things to catch the YouTube audience up and people that we don't talk to on a daily basis. So, the internet at the church, we're still working on getting that. We actually have a Starlink satellite dish. So, better internet is better uh, bandwidth, which is live stream. So, we're going to have the upstream. We can get the live streams. I'm working on that. We've got the camera. I've got everything right. I've got a laptop. I've built that. It's got the OBS stream software on it. It's good to go. We're just waiting on a few parts to the Starlink, and then I've got to install that. And then I've got to fix the, uh, we're going to get a mi another microphone perhaps. I'm looking at a Blue Yeti to get up here to stream live with that. And also I need an Elgato live stream card. So we're, gonna, we're working on it. America's Promise is getting there. Uh, website, I know you guys have gone on the website lately and seen that the inventory slash catalog has a lot of dead end links. I'm currently overhauling the entire inventory. I've got to assign SKUs to all of our bookstore items and all that, but it's almost done. So the online bookstore will be ready to go, hopefully by the end of next month, which includes, um, like I said, like you've seen some of you perhaps that you are able to uh, purchase things via online transactions. And as we go along, we'll try to integrate Apple Pay, Google Pay, which I think we already have, um, of course, credit and debit cards, and PayPal. So we're working on those things. It does take time for everything to get connected. Also, I'm working on all of our current digital archives, things that we have available on hard drives here at the church, which would include uh, past sermons by uh, Pastor Sheldon Emery and Pastor Barley. Those would be video and audio sermons. I'm packing all those up into um, archive files, so I actually have them as torrent files. So if you guys out there use BitTorrent clients, you can actually have a torrent directly from us. You can download everything. What's nice about Bit client, uh, BitTorrent clients is you're able to select your files and just get what you want. I'm working on that. We also are available uh, to share files on SoulSeek. So if anybody uses SoulSeek out there, America's Promise will have that too. And you can get it directly from our server 24-7 because we have basically what's a seed box on a network attached storage here at the church. The internet that's getting more and more speedy here will allow us to um, bundle all those files and get them to you. So you can use file compression software, WinRAR is what I would suggest, 32-bit or x86 or 64-bit, uh, it's up to you. Audio, uh, all of our audio I'm currently working on, remastering the audio in MP3 format with ID3 embedded metadata tags. So that will be nice and neat. That's going to be on the torrent files as well. Also, I'm going to try to remaster some of uh, Pastor Emery and Barley's sermons at a FLAC audio codex so that you can have lossless. So I'm going to try to get you guys the best remastered possible out there um, without doing any audio engineering. Same with our old archives of videos. Those will all be available via server, and we're going to get this on the website one of these days. I'm using uh, artificial intelligence to remaster the videos up to at least 1080p. Okay, so that's what we're doing with uh, sharper images and better audio. So I'm working on that right now. It takes time, unfortunately, to do... Um, Artificial intelligence video remastering takes a lot of processing power, which I currently don't have the hardware to support that, so we're working on that. So they'll be out um, for you guys to download personally on your computers or anything to share from us, probably an MP4 or MKV uh, container file at X264 or H265 if you guys want to stream that live to yourselves via our network server. If you don't know what I mean, ask your favorite grandson or nephew, and they'll translate what I just said for you. And like I said, basically what it is going to be is a 24-7 seed box for all of Reed, Emery, and Barley's sermons at the highest possible quality, at the highest best possible bit rate and size for you guys. And... Um, being that we have the internet that will have the upload speeds to get it to you, we also have a solid state drive, maybe a nano drive M2. So we're going to have that all bundled up for you. So I need better hardware. So if anybody has an, uh, an NVIDIA RTX 4070 card they're not using, go ahead and send it to me. Um, I know it sounds like overkill, but to do AI video processing takes at least 20 teraflops. So, you know, I will burn up my processor. And yes, I use AMD, so it does run a little cooler. But I will burn that up trying to do this. So anyway, now 
That's what I'm saying. We will have the archive files. We'll have them online, available digitally at all times for you guys. I'm working on that too, just to have everything up and available. And that includes PDFs. So you can get the PDFs of things as well. Okay, so you don't even have to, you can go onto the site, grab them, put them directly to your computer, then you can put them on any smart device, stream them to your TV, whatever you want, because it'll be a share, okay, a network attached share. So if you have any questions about computers or what I just said, email or call the church and I will explain to you what we're doing. And also we do have a believer out in North Central West Virginia who called us last week. She wishes to start a weekly Bible study, particularly concerning the Bible boot camp modules from Lawrence Blanchard. And she asked that we'd make an announcement. So anybody that is near North Central West Virginia, just look, give the church a call and we'll put you in touch with the lady that wishes to kick that off. You have time. It'll be April 22nd is when she wants to do that. So if you are near the northern border of, I'm not sure the city or major city, um, south of Pittsburgh, west of D.C., so somewhere right there. So if you're around West Virginia, just let us know, and we'll get you in touch with her so that you can do it. And it is going to be weekly, so, you know. All right, so we do have a Sunday sermon to get to, don't we? Okay, so this morning, I'm going to get to Joel. Turn to Joel. We're going to read through Joel and address some things that are happening in the nation today. Some end-time prophecy, which I know you guys have been begging for, so we're going to get into it today. All right, let me read one, Joel 1, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, verse 2, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, or even in the days of your father? Now notice the word old men here, found in the beginning of verse 2, is from the Hebrew word zakin, which is translated 115 times as elders, and 19 times as old men, like we see here in Joel 2. And that's in the Old Testament. Now, this word old men is used to designate the Levites, judges, and leaders of Israel. So this is addressed, in other words, to people who, are, who have wisdom and understanding, who are capable of leading the people. Okay? So this is addressed to those people. And notice in verse 2, Joel asked a question. Has this been in your days or even in the days of your father? Of course, this demonstrates that whatever follows in Joel chapter 1, that it is not past history, neither is it current events of Joel's day. So, Joel 1.3 says, Tell you children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So this message is to be passed on through the generations. Not just three generations, as some pastors say, that's Bible idiom, meaning that the message is to be carried forward until a generation is reached in which the events are fulfilled. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. And as we go along, we'll see that the generation is actually the generation living just prior to the time known as the day of the Lord. Okay, so this is to whom that's addressed. Joel 1.4 that which the palmer worm has left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. So in this time we see that there's a lack of prosperity in the land due to a blight that ensues due to these insects, locusts, canker worms, and such. Joel 1, five for Awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. So the people in the land who are accustomed to partaking in the land's wealth and the prosperity of the land are now howling because of lack of the land's produce, right? Verse 6, For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion, he hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches there are, thereof are made white. Verse 6, then, identifies the worms, locusts, and caterpillars, which is from verse 4, as a nation. That Hebrew word there is goy, which means a people. So a people have come to destroy the land, and here it says strong and without number, having the teeth of a lion. So they've come to eat, chew, or devour. 
right? In verse six, verse seven, we see the word "my vine," my vine. Now, for your new listeners out there, we will identify the "my vine." If you turn to Isaiah five, verse seven, you'll see it here on the board. Isaiah five seven: For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness but behold, a cry. So here in Isaiah, we can establish that the vine or vineyard here mentioned in Joel is the house of Israel. Okay? So we have the house of Israel. And of course, if you look at Isaiah 5, you'll see that it actually opens up with an allegory or a parable about that vine. And of course, by the time you get to verse 7, we'll see that the vine or vineyard is identified with the house of Israel. All right. Now, And it says here, we look at heritage. So we'll look at Jeremiah 12, 7. I have forsaken mine house, I have left mine heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Now notice this is a background of what's going on in Joel right now. We look at the word heritage here. We can bring this all the way back around. Who is God's heritage? Well, you can actually use the book of Joel to find that out. Book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 2. We see, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel. So the house of Israel is the heritage of God. The house of Israel is God's vine. And look at what he's done. Whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. As we go along this morning and other sermons I have planned in this vein, here you'll find the actions, the things brought against Israel are always God's doing. I dare you to find the word devil or Satan in Joel. You won't find it. The reason Israel is in the state they're in, as we go along this morning, we'll find out, it's that God's done these things. God's done these things. And according to what we're establishing now, the heritage of God, the vineyard of God, God's vine is the house of Israel. Okay. Now, back to Jeremiah 12. Jeremiah 12. Now, this is a parallel to the events told in Joel. Jeremiah 12, verse 7. I have forsaken mine house, I have left mine heritage, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest, it crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird, the birds round about are against her. Come ye assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desert, a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man layeth it to heart. The spoilers are come upon all high places around the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from the one end of the land, even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace." They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit. And they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. So, this is exactly parallel to what it is we're reading about in Joel. Now, we've yet to identify everything in Joel 1. But as you can see, Israel is in trouble. Okay? Of course, if we look at the time element of Joel, as we said... We can see the time element here in Jeremiah is also in time prophecy, as well as Jeremiah's day. So keep that in mind. Prophecies are often layered that way. So back to Joel 1. So from Joel 1, 7, we see that the house of Israel is God's heritage, just like we saw. And then verse 7 also mentions a fig tree. Fig tree. If you go to Jeremiah 24... I know we're flipping around a whole lot today. We have the house of Israel being the vineyard 
God's heritage. Jeremiah 24 will help identify, and I'm sure you all know, who the fig tree is. Jeremiah 24, verse 1, The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set up before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smith from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. Remember, he did cherry-pick the carpenters and smiths. Nebuchadnezzar wanted a working force. Okay? One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Now, notice that in Joel or in Jeremiah 24, we see two baskets of figs, one good and one bad, but both make up the house of Judah. Very important. Now, that's a sermon in and of itself, I know. It's very important that we understand that God was going to work on the good figs for good and work on the bad figs for bad. Okay, because that's a fundamental difference between what we know the house of Judah is and sometimes what British Israelism calls the house of Judah. The modern church gets this mixed up too. Because if we could just split these two figs up, then we've got good people for all the good in the world and bad people for all the bad in the world. It doesn't work that way. This is the house of Judah. Okay. All right. Now, so we'll see that the figs here, according to Jeremiah, are symbolic of the fig tree mentioned back there in Joel, where he says, Embarked my fig tree, he has made it clean bare, and cast away the branches thereof are made white. Okay, so we have the vine, the house of Israel, and the fig tree, the house of Judah. And in Joel, they're both being laid waste. Okay, both. Back to Joel. Joel 1, 8. Lament like a virgin, girded with sockcloth, for the husband of her youth. Now, we know that the people spoken of in Joel are now God's children. All of them, Israel and Judah. If you understand that America is the Zion of Bible prophecy, the place of regathered Israel and Judah, then this very well applies to us, this generation, or upon whom the latter days have come, right? So this is now us, and look at what we're doing now. We're in trouble because of a nation that's come in to steal our resources and take the produce right out of our hands, and we are to lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of your youth of her youth, our youth, right? There's the difference. Kingdom ministers and kingdom believers know that's our youth, the house of Israel. So, who's the husband? Who's the youth, right? So this is, I know, Resurrection Sunday, and a lot of people that don't normally tune into Sunday sermons might be, so we're going to ask, who is this husband, and why is this nation here Lamenting for him. Well, Jeremiah 3.8, which I'm sure you all know. This is fundamental. Jeremiah 3.8, And I saw, for when the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Playing the harlot, committing whoredoms, is serving other gods. That's what Israel was guilty of. So, God was the husband of Israel's youth, and he divorced her. And like I say, it shocks modern Christians, God is a divorcee. He is. So, saying divorce is not biblical, that should be a slap in the face right there. God put her away and gave her a bill of divorce, exactly as Moses told us to do under the law. Exactly that. So, now, Jeremiah 3, and we're going to stay there. Jeremiah 3, I'm going to go to verse 12 now. Verse 12. Go and proclaim these words towards the north, 
and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. So notice in tw verse 12, there is a statement made to, by God to Israel, which if you know, he repeatedly makes countless times throughout the Bible, and that is, Return to me, and I will return unto you. It's always God's statement to Israel. It's a promise He makes. And it, come, it should bring to mind another famous verse, 2 Chronicles 7.14, right? If my people, who? Israel, which are called by my name, Christian Israelites, those who are walking upright, if they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now that's a memory verse for most all of us kingdom believers. Why? Because God tells us the exact thing we need to do to right the ship. And you'll notice the absence of several things that people put in there that are not there. If my people would elect the right president, if my people would just find the right Bible translation, if my people could settle whether the earth is flat or not, then I will heal their flat land. It's not there, is it? Turn from their wicked ways, and we'll get to what this means. Very simple, almost too easy. Right? Back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 3, I'll look at uh, verse 13 now. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Now notice, God has done these things. God has done these things. And the strangers are the ones getting the rewards of the land. Maybe even protection in the land. Verse 14, Turn, O black-siding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city, and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Now, this is a very interesting verse. I've been wanting to get to this one for a long time. And I bring it up often enough with people that uh, when I'm asked about the reasons why or the causes of children who were brought up in the kingdom ministry who then turn away from it or outright reject it later in life. And it certainly is not this Satan or the devil of the modern church doing these things. Because it seems from this verse that the sovereignty of God is illustrated. Right? In other words, it's God who chooses who is brought unto Zion. And from this verse, it seems like he's fairly selective. We see one of a city, two of a family. Now, that's the reason why some people who grow up in the kingdom ministry later reject it. It's God that does the choosing. It's not that you didn't say the right thing at the right time or that you caught him on a bad day. God will choose who goes to Zion and who does not. Right? But the reasons, the why and how of it, that's not my business. It's God's business. I don't know why He does these things, but I do know He does these things for a reason, and that reason is righteousness. That I know. That I do know. Now, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with understanding and knowledge. Feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now these pastors and these shepherds here, the word pastors is shepherds, these are not just any run-of-the-mill pastor in name only, okay? These are, what we have today are the pastors of the modern church. He's not talking about those guys, the ones that preach lies and half-truths at best. He's talking about the true ministers of the kingdom gospel here. That's who he promises to send to us in the latter day, Right? That's the true ministers of the kingdom gospel. So, so here, like I said, in verse 8, we saw earlier that God had divorced Israel. And in Joel, 
we saw the people lamenting for the husband of her youth. Right? Should bring to mind what book of the Bible? Where are we going? Husbands. Returning unto husbands. Hosea 2. Everybody knew. All right. My favorite chapter in the entire Bible, and we'll actually, we'll run over my favorite verse of all time. Some Pastor Reed trivia for you. Now, Hosea 2, 1, Say unto ye, brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Rohama. Okay, and that literally means Ami. Say unto my brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy, those who have obtained mercy. This goes Bible-wide, this verse here. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. So here is God pleading that Israel knocks it off. Now this is a prophecy concerning divorced Israel. Look at verse 6. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she find not her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. And I've said this before. You will hear this phrase today in this land. When people, Christians or not, they'll say it would be better if we went back to the old ways. Back to the old ways. Not necessarily the Constitution. The laws of God that we had in this land before when it first was formed. We had it better back then, Pastor Reed. Now we're not going to go back to the Constitution. We're going to go back to God's law at the end of the age. I don't read about end of the age prophecy where Israel turns and returns under the U.S. Constitution. No such thing. It's had its day. We're not going to revise it. We're not going to make it perfect. We're going back, apparently, to our first husband. Who? God and His laws. You read other Bible prophecies about us returning unto Him singing and with joy, right? Verse 14, Hosea 2. Here's end-time prophecy concerning America. The Zion of Bible prophecy. Therefore, behold, while I lure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her, and I will give her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Notice she's singing because she's going to be betrothed. She's betrothed now. She will be married to God. Christian, Israel, believers only. Because remember when we came out of Egypt, we went and Moses officiated the wedding ceremony for us between God and his people. He made us priests and kings, recall? So, and we see here from Hosea that apparently the catalyst for Israel turning is that they've been, according to Joel, in such a state of trouble, they're being robbed and plundered, that national Israel returns unto God, their former husband. You see what this is. Israel has to get into so much trouble, then she turns to God and says it was better when we were under him and his household under his law than it is now. And of course here we've seen that God promises to return unto them when we choose to turn to him. And the rest of Hosea chapter 2, if you want to read the rest, it does contain kingdom language concerning what God will do with his people after they return to him. And it's always the promise of the kingdom and the rest we read about. So we have Joel prophesying about national Israel in trouble. And we have God telling us the reasons why Israel is in trouble in the first place. Right Now I ask you, why is Israel... Why is America, the Zion of Bible prophecy, in the state that Joel is talking about? Is America in so much trouble? Are we in so much trouble because the perfect Bible translation has yet to come out? No. Are we in so much trouble now because we have yet to ascertain the exact canonicity of the Scriptures? 
No. The perfect president, he hasn't been elected yet. Is that why we're in so much trouble? We'll talk about Christian government next week. Because Christians are to have an active role in the civil government. Now, are we in so much trouble because we've yet to uncover God's real name? No. Are we actually in trouble, according to Joel, because we have yet to pin down the feast days or Sabbath? In other words, have we found the perfect calendar? No. Are we in trouble, as Joel says, because the perfect pastor hasn't been found yet? And kingdom ministers are not perfect people. Or that the Constitution hasn't been righted, or that we haven't passed the right laws, or that the right laws haven't been nullified. No. Maybe we're in so much trouble, and Joel just left it out, because we have a cosmic super being walking around who's just too powerful a foe for us and God. Or are we in trouble because of the fault of another people? The fault of another people. And we just haven't, as Israel, gotten around to kicking them all out of the country yet. Is that why we're in trouble? No. Why is all this happening? And what do we do about it? Let's read on in Joel, because we know he's speaking to us. We'll go to Joel 1, go to verse 9. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Okay. Verse 9, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Now notice here, Joel says we're in trouble. We have strangers in the land eating and destroying and plundering the land's produce. The next thing he says Israel is going to get in trouble. They're going to want to go back to their former husband. And by the mode of coming back to him, Joel says, the tithes and offerings have vanished. And the Lord's true ministers, that's the true ministers, once he told us about in Jeremiah, they're in dire need. Verse 10, we see that the land's produce is lost. Verse 11, we see that both the husbandmen and the vine dressers are howling. Now, that would be the people in charge of running the nation. Husbandmen and vine dressers, civil leaders, they're howling because the nation is in such a state of trouble. Now, you think about these things in 2024. It's like the newspaper today, right? Verse 12, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The things taken away from Israel here do not necessarily have to be physical blessings. They can also be spiritual things that have dried up. And you'll see that a lot in other end time prophecies. It's not just that we don't have enough apples in the land, but he talks about rivers drying up. Physical water, which we have problems with, our farmers can't get enough of it. Water of the Word. It's all but gone in this nation. So we're in trouble. Verse 13, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of God. Again, the Lord's ministers are in a state of lament because of what? Well, because of the withholding of the meat and drink offering. And you notice the word withholding. They have it and they won't give it. It would not be just of God to tell us to give something we don't have. Right? You can't give tithe if you don't have it. God says you have it, meat and drink, wealth, but you're not giving it to God. And then you wonder the state's in trouble. So, it should remind you of somebody else, another minor prophet. Used to be popular preaching. Micah 3. Even from the days, Malachi 3, I'm sorry. Micah's also in time prophecy. (laughs) Malachi 3, 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, 
and I will return unto you. There's that statement again. Saith the Lord of hosts, but ye said, wherein shall we return? Ye who? Israel, they don't even know how to return to God. God says, you've abandoned me. But return to me and I will return to you. And Israel says, well, how do we return to you? How do we do that? So, Malachi 8, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed ye? In tithes and offerings. So there it is again. Verse 9, if I read verse 9, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So the, this is the exact problem we're reading about in Joel. The withholding of the meat and drink offering. Israel wants to return to God, but they don't know how. God says, you've robbed me. That's why you're suffering. Israel says, well, how have we robbed you? Withholding meat and drink offerings in the Lord's house. And then in verse 9, we saw God declares a curse upon His people. And what that curse is, is what we're reading about in Joel. The strangers in the land. Now, the answer, how we turn to God, the answer to this question is actually found in verse 10 of Malachi 3. How when will we return? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. Test me, saith the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows, casements, of heaven, and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Israel. Quite the promise, isn't it? And like I said, this used to be preached fairly often, but today in modern times it's rarely read. Very rarely even mentioned from the pulpit. And as a matter of fact, if you remember my tithe sermons from a long time ago, the exact opposite is being preached now. Because if you tithe to God, you're legalistic. You keep the law, you're legalistic. And Jesus abolished all those laws. And then yet in Joel, we see that the entire nation's in trouble. And one of the main things Joel brings up in chapter 1 is really all chapter 1's about. Israel's in trouble because they're robbing God. Then God takes around, turns around and tells us in the last book of the Old Testament, if you'll give your tithe, I will make sure you have plenty. Right? Now, look at the effect of this. When Israel tithes, when we stop robbing God, God says, when you tithe, I will rebuke the devourer, canker worms, palmer worms, caterpillars, that nation, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall the vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Look at the effect of Israel returning unto God in the tithing only. Just tithing does this. We're not going to kick the devourer out of this nation. God says, I will rebuke that devourer when you give tithes, when you return unto me. So, now we're reading in Joel that the people or the nation in Joel were destroying or devouring what the land produces. So in other words, they were taking it right out of the hands of the Israelites living in the nation, and the strangers were in effect enjoying the benefits of the land over Israel. And Israel's prosperity, of course, has suffered and waned, according to Joel. Now what's a step in the right direction for Israel then? National Israel. Well, God says, if you stop robbing me, I will give you plenty and you'll be in want of nothing. He'll rebuke the devourer. Now look at verse 12. Malachi 3, And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Apparently Israel will be so blessed that it'll be global knowledge, common knowledge that these are God's people. And God has blessed them. If we do what? Tithes and offerings. So, that's the promise of prosperity. 
And like I said, it's not just the physical provisions God will restore to our people. It's also the spiritual blessings as well. If you read kingdom language concerning the end-time kingdom, you'll find that that is rest, peace, and prosperity for God's people. Peace and prosperity. And you can also establish the time element from Malachi if you'd like by reading the rest of chapter 3 and 4 to find out that this is indeed end time prophecy. So it fits right along with what Joel and Jeremiah were saying. All right? So the ministers in Joel were to be lamenting and praying and pleading, not for the removal of the president, not for the removal of the locusts or the strangers. They were praying for Israel to do what? Turn to fill in the blank for me. The law of tithe. A lot of people won't say that. I will. The law of tenths. Right? So not necessarily just tithe. If the nation, according to God and His prophets, the solution for the end of Israel's calamities in the land is for Israel to stop doing their own thing and turn unto the law and be obedient of it. Tithes is a facet of that, right? Because you wouldn't get that idea that tithe is the cure-all. It's the step in the right direction, and 10% is just a start. You turn unto the law. My job is cut out for me when I have to explain to people that the law is still valid. You start saying that. It's not popular preaching, because then along comes duty, and uh, responsibility, accountability, due diligence. Nobody wants that stuff anymore. They want, to, they want God to turn unto us, but we don't want to do anything. We just want God's favor. God says no. Joel and Malachi mention the law of tithe as being neglected as the prime reason for the trouble we find ourselves in today. According to Joel and Malachi, that's the prime reason. God says he will rebuke the devourer if we do this one thing. Joel and several other prophets also indict pastors found in the land today for not faithfully preaching or teaching the kingdom gospel. And that's the subject of next week's sermon. Because since just because you're a minister of the gospel or you call yourself that does not mean that you cannot yourself be rebuked. Because the prophets take a lot of chapters to do that as well. And that's a big problem. How in the world do I teach the law to Israel if the law is gone and nobody knows who Israel is? How do you preach the kingdom law to Israel? The kingdom revolves around the law. The bill of divorce is a matter of law. Right? We do have our work cut out for them. Now, you can talk about wealth and keeping it any way you want. You can talk about gold. You can talk about silver. Stocks, bonds, Bitcoin, tax dodging. God says the way to have blessings in the land and increase is first obey the law of tithes. And that's a very simple thing you can start today. You can calculate how much you make in a matter of minutes. Take 10% off. Right? It's not like we're asking anything. And you don't give tithes so Pastor Reed can have a lot of money. You don't give it so we can go online and live stream and tell the whole nation of Israel about the uh, caterpillars and canker worms. You tithe because God promises He will step in and take care of the nation of peoples He's brought in against us in order to put us into a low and impoverished state. God says, when you tithe, when you turn to my law, I will heal your land. And a lot of Christians will give those verses a lot of thought, but then they'll turn around and try to do it their own way. Their own way instead of God. God will set the land right, and He will cleanse it. And that's not up to me or my methods. Not at all. My job as a true minister of the Lord is to teach you fine people the laws of God and God's instruction. You see, and this is the thing that a lot of people don't understand. Just because you're saved or you've attained a personal salvation, does not spare you from the national trouble we're in. You see, and that's a hard concept to get across to most Christians. The nation of Israel is in trouble, exactly as Joel said, whether you're Christian or not. Right? 
It's only the Christian people who have their hearts right with God who are going to give to God's work and God's house. You're not going to find the unbeliever giving this. That's why this message is addressed to Israel. I'm not picking on you. I'm not saying you don't pay tithe. But the rain falls on the just and unjust alike, right? Being saved, being knowledgeable of who Israel is even, does not spare you from the nation's trouble. Right? And I think you can all agree with me and the prophets that we're in trouble. Big time. It's all you ever hear about nowadays. And everybody has all these ideas about how we're going to set the nation aright. And yet here it is, the simplest thing. God says, return unto me. Now, the title of this morning's per- sermon is perfect. So what is perfect? Go to Psalm 19. What is perfect? According to Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, is sure, making the wise, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Look at the function of God's law. Now, this is the thing that's been put away in 90% of the churches in America. This law has been put away because the pastors say we don't need it anymore. God says through David, the prophet, the, Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's able to convert the soul. Most pastors think that's their job. Apparently that's not their function. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And what is the testimony of Jesus according to Revelation? The spirit of prophecy. Making wise the simple. Think of the Proverbs, and every one of those reflects the law. The statutes, which tells us how to go about laws, and law-giving and law-abiding of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And even David later says that the judgments of the Lord are righteous. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. This is where Israel's messed up. This entire verse is upside down in modern churches. And yet, Pastor Reed comes along and says, no, I'm not perfect. The president's not perfect. The constitution's not perfect. The translation's not perfect. Other kingdom ministers aren't perfect. The law is perfect. We, Israel, need to get back to that. Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourselves. God's law, not man's law, is perfect. And so the best instruction that can come from me is to teach this law. I focus on you people, okay? Because I know you guys understand the validity of the law. And I know that I'm preaching to people who know God and wish to do His word, His will, that want to walk on the path. So, In closing, I'll leave you with one passage this morning. And you think on this for Resurrection Sunday. And you think about the state of the nation and that hundreds of thousands of people are in church today, even ones that don't attend church. And you will never hear this. They've heard everything else. David says the law of the Lord is perfect. And my job is to teach you that. That's it. And Israel's going to turn to this. Law, not Trump, not Biden's law, right? God's law. Matthew 6, we'll tie this in for our New Testament believers. Don't think I've got a slide. I do. Matthew 6, 25. Everybody knows these. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for, what, uh, for your body what ye shall put on, Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? These words are in red, so a direct quote from Jesus himself. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much more better than they? Which of you by a taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, in other words, because of all this, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom and God's righteousness, which is, how do we know what is righteous? The law. Seek ye first and all these things. What things? Well, Rebuking the devourer for one, writing the nation. All these things will be added unto you. That's the kingdom. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God says, when you trust me, when you return unto me, I will return unto you. And all these things will be added unto you. Now that's Jesus Christ teaching his people Israel. And it exactly is an echo of what God promised in the prophets. What God promised in the prophets. Don't take any thought of it. You want to get the nation right? Stop looking for the perfect man, the perfect Bible, the perfect preacher, the perfect solution. The solution to Israel's trouble in the nation is to get back to the laws of God and they are perfect. Seek ye first the kingdom and everything will be added unto you. That's all we have for today.